We are going to talk about testing and production today. It's the one topic that I am super passionate about, um, and I have some experience with it that I'm really excited to share with you guys today. So um, yeah, let, let's get started. So I'm I'm a developer advocate at a company called Split Software. And before I was a dev advocate, I was a test engineer. And so I did um, QA and automation and testing for a few years before I became a dev advocate. And being a test engineer was really hard for me. Um, and I think it's just a... a a hard job in general because most of the problems that I had revolved around staging and using a staging environment or a QA environment. And I just want to see in the chat if you could, if you guys could just tell me who here uses a staging environment. Like, just tell me yes if you use a staging environment. Um, perfect. Yep, I see so many yeses. Great, amazing. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of the, the issues that I had with staging, um, I, I just want to see if you guys have these issues too. So these are some of the things that I've dealt with and I'm sure you guys have dealt with them too. So the first issue that I had when I was testing um, in a staging environment was data mismatch. So the, the data and staging doesn't match production, which means the test results don't always match, right? So I used to work really hard on testing every product requirement, and I used to go through the documentation um, with the product owner, and I worked with all of my developers to fix all the bugs and make sure my end-to-end -end tests were passing, and then I would sign off on the feature, and as soon as it's launched to production, there would be a bug. And it's such a horrible feeling, just as, as any engineer, if you're a front-end engineer, back-end, test, test, whatever. Um, if you're an engineer and you work on this feature and you roll it out to production and it doesn't work, right? So it, it's, it's just a, a horrible process, you know? Um, the next thing is a thing called configuration drift. So let's say that you get paged one night because there's an incident for your mobile application and you look at the logs and you identify what the problem is and in order to fix it, you have to update a specific configuration in production. So you make the change in production and you go back to sleep because it's like the middle of the night, right? And so even though you fixed the issue, what you've also done is created an even bigger divide between your staging and production environments because you didn't make the same change in your staging environment. So many times your staging environments are not the same as production because of these changes that are made during incident management. And this is called configuration drift. So what's the point of testing and staging if it's not going to give me the same results as production, right? So the next thing that I that I experienced was that there was really bad performance in staging. So when you're writing tests in, in a staging environment, you often have to add weights and sleeps because things take longer to load, right? But that's not how my users are going to interact with my features. If, if I'm writing a test in staging and I say, log in, wait 10 seconds for this button to appear, click on this thing, and then wait another 20 seconds for this page to load, and then click on this, like, um, my user is not gonna wait 20 seconds, 10 seconds for something to appear, so why should the test do that, right? Um, this is just a really bad user experience, and it doesn't match the way that my users are gonna interact with my features in production. And lastly, nobody cares if staging is down. So I would be assigned to test these hot fix tickets, which are just like critical bug fixes that have to be immediately released to production. So I would log into staging to test, but staging would be down. So I ping the DevOps guy and he tells me they're doing performance testing and staging. So I have to wait until that's done. And then I try logging in again after um, the performance tests are done, and then this time I get the 404 screen of death. So I ping um, the IT guy, and he says I have to open an IT ticket, and then it has to get escalated by my manager, but she's at lunch. So <laughs> guys, your comments are so funny. I love them. 
Um, I have to get the ticket escalated by my manager. Um, and meanwhile, all I'm trying to do is test this high priority ticket and nobody seems to care, right? So no one's gonna get a call in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner if staging is down. And I was so fed up with dealing with a shitty staging environment and being blamed for when things didn't work, right? It's, you're constantly looked at as the gatekeeper for features being released. When you're, when you're an engineer and you're not an, on an engineering team, like if something doesn't work, like, oh, who built it, who tested it, like that's, that's who um, you need to blame, right? So I thought there has to be a better way to test software because my users are not going to log into staging. They're going to log into production. So I did a ton of homework and I researched what are other companies doing. And this is what I learned. So staging is the norm. Like we just saw in the beginning of this session, so many of, of you guys are using staging environments. Um, and it, it's especially the case in um, waterfall companies. So a lot of waterfall companies are using staging, but even a lot of agile companies are using staging. Most companies have more than one staging environment. So, you know, they'll have staging and pre-prod and beta and QA. And I used to work at a company that had one staging environment for every day of the week. So there was like staging Monday, staging Tuesday, staging Wednesday. Um, that was a handful. There was also, um, I've also worked at companies that like only specific people have access to specific environments. Um, companies do this differently, but most companies have more than one non-production environment. The other thing is that, that I learned is that companies are testing in production. So big name companies like Google and Facebook and Netflix and Twitter, they're all testing in production. And when I read this, I was like, what is happening? What is testing in production? How is this possible? Um, I've never heard of this thing. Um, and so what is it? So testing in production means testing your features in the environment that your features will live in. And it means not using a dummy environment like staging or QA. And I was like, oh my God, this is perfect when I saw this. Um, and I also learned that testing in prod doesn't mean that you only test in prod. So you're still using staging for GDPR and SOX compliant and, you know, all of the flows that um, your legal team won't let you test in prod. Um, so you don't, you're not only testing in prod, you can still use staging for those other flows. And I was like, I have to start doing this. So I looked into the how, how is this possible? What's the first step? And the first step was really to, to learn about feature flags and feature flags are just a way to separate code deployment from feature release. So the idea here is you deploy your code to production behind a feature flag, test it in production, and then release the feature when it's bug free. Um, and so I'm gonna show you how this works. And this is kind of what, what feature flags look like. So basically you create a feature flag from the UI um, and then you target your internal teammates. And so what that means is you put your devs, your testers, your product, your design, all of these people are targeted in your feature flag. So anything related to this feature can only be seen by the users that are inside of that feature flag. And you can see the default is off, the toggle is off. So that means that the people on the right, these like real end users, they're not gonna see anything related to that feature. They don't see any, any changes because they're not in the feature flag. So only these people, um, the devs, testers, product design, only they see changes related to that feature. And so while the feature flag is off, you go in and you test everything. You test all of your functionality, your you test your design, you go through all the requirements and make sure everything works. Um, and if you happen to find a bug in your new feature, or if something goes wrong, it has no impact on your end users because they don't have access to it. They're not targeted in your flag. So this is um, kind of a way to manage risk, right? And then once you know your feature is working in production, you turn on the flag already knowing that your features are working in production and you didn't break anything that was existing. 
um, and now your users are, are happy and they're dancing because they have a perfect feature, right? So you go through this process of um, creating a feature flag, targeting your users, test your flows with those users. So if I'm going to go in as a QA engineer, I'm going to go in, test those features manually, write some automation scripts, make sure it works in production, and then turn the feature flag on once I know that it already works. And I thought this is such a great process, but how do you automate it? Because you can't possibly manually test every feature every time you release. And with feature flags, you have this added complexity. So how do you automate it? And there's two options here for automation. So, so <clears throat> excuse me, the first option is that you can target your test users and automate the flows with them. So what this looks like is if you go back here, um, let's say you have some, a, a test user, we'll call him automation bot one. So if I take automation bot one and I target automation bot one inside of this feature flag, every time automation bot one logs in and runs the test for this feature, it's going to be able to see the feature, interact with it, catch any bugs because it's targeted in this um, feature flag. And what's great about this approach is that every time um, Every time this test runs, no matter if the feature flag is on or off, this user will be able to see that feature and interact with it. So even when you turn the feature flag on, you don't have to make any other changes. Um, the, only, the only thing to note with this approach is that there is increased fragility because um, if for some reason someone removes automation bot one from that list, um, the test is going to fail. So you just want to make sure that um, you have a good way to, to make sure that only specific people have access to be able to add and remove people from your list of, of targeted users. Um, the next step is, the next option is um, to make a custom feature flag abstraction, which makes it easy to mock out in your test. So basically what this means is you have um, three tests for every feature. So in the first test, you simulate the feature flag on. So for this test duration, if you get any request asking if the feature flag is on, you say yes. In the second test, you simulate the feature flag off. So any request coming in from here, um, you, if you get any requests asking if the feature flag is on, you say no. And then in the last test, you just want to make sure that you can go through the entire flow regardless of if the flag is on or off. So you're really exp explicit here in, this, in, this, in these tests, and um, the tests become much more self-documenting and descriptive. Um, and then whenever, whenever a test runs in this sort of system, you just want to fake out all the, all the variants of the experiment because, um, because when it's fake, you're reducing the complexity of the different scenarios, which means faster tests. So basically what you're doing is you're declar declaratively setting the state of a flag for the duration of the test. And then when you run these tests in production, you want to make sure that your tests only interact with other testing entities in production. So, um, the way that you do that is you have a backend flagging system in production. So something like um, is test user equals true for all of your test users, and then something like um, is test user equals false for all of your regular um, like non-test users. Um, and this way you can separate test data from real data in your data dashboard. So everything that's a test object in production is going to have this flag. So you have a test thing, something that's used for testing in production. It's going to have the specific data attribute that differentiates it from a real object in production. So here you have um, here you have a few different test objects, and you can see that I've labeled them as is test equals true, and then by default everything in production is um, is false. And for this differenti differentiation, you can use ARIA labels, you can use um, any sort of data attribute. Um, you, you can, you know, play with the DOM and see what works for you. Um, and what's great here is that once you get data 
coming back in. So like if you're using Looker or Datadog or whatever, once you get that data coming back, you can separate and say everything with is test equals true is going to be on this side and everything with is test equals false is going to be on this side. Um, and so that way you can make business decisions based off of your real data, not based off of your test data. And of course, there are exceptions because when you're testing in production, sometimes you have to make exceptions and that's okay. So for example, if, if your software is integrated with a third party, it can be tricky to test. So you can create a unique header in the API request that you send to the third party and say, hey, any request that you get with this header is a test and I want you to treat it in this other way, do this other thing. Um, and that's something that I've done that works really well. Maybe when you send an email confirmation, something is different in the test. Um, there, there, there will be exceptions when you, when you run tests in production, and um, I think that's just the price you have to pay. But I think overall, the benefits are going to outweigh the risks, and, and we're going to take a look at that in a minute. Um, and then a question I get a lot is, how do you know what to test in production? How do you know where to start? And I would say there's there's two places. Um, the first is start with your product person and talk about what, what are the most important, critical um, business flows that we have. So let, what are what are the flows that give us the most business value? What are um, what are the most important flows for our product? The next the next thing is the data analyst. So talk to your data person about like what are people doing the most in our application? So between these two people, you should have a really good solid list of um, which flows you need to start for. And then besides feature flags, there's some other dependencies that you need. So you need an automation framework um, just because, again, it's not scalable to manually test every feature. Um, you need a job scheduler that will run your tests. And this can be um, nightly. This can be with every uh, build. This can be um, hourly. And you can have different sets of tests running at different times. Um, and that's all configurable. Um, you also need an alerting tool that's going to alert you when a test fails so you can go in and figure out what's going on. Okay, and these are the tools that I've used for testing in prod um, that I'm comfortable recommending. So for feature flagging, um, I recommend split. And for um, automation, my absolute favorite automation framework is robot. It's a really easy keyword-driven library that you can use to write tests. Um, I've also used Cypress. I've used um, Puppeteer, Protractor. There's a few. Um, for my job schedulers, I have zero preference between you know, Jenkins and CircleCI and Maven, um, Travis. Um, they're, they're all pretty much great, great tools. Um, and for alerting, um, you can, again, you can configure this to say, like, my business critical flows, if they fail, like, I need to wake someone up and we can use PagerDuty for that. Um, or, you know, the flows that are that are running as planned, that are, um, that are doing fine, we can use Slack for, for those alerts. Okay, so this whole process of testing in production, like, this makes sense to me. This um, the process of using feature flags, targeting your teammates, making sure everything works first before turning on the feature flag, having your automation um, your automation run the tests for you, integrating with your job scheduler, like this all makes perfect sense to me. But if it's so simple, why isn't everyone testing in production? Why are you guys all still using staging environments if you have this process that solves all of your problems? And it's because people are scared. Companies don't test in production because of this fear and this lack of trust in their systems. And for the same reason, they refuse to engage in the tools and the process changes that are going to generate um, that trust and they're too afraid of the risks and let's talk about some of some of those risks so there's a few things that you can do to mitigate the risks of testing in prod so the first one we talked about was um, setting up feature flags before you launch so again you target your internal teammates 
test with those people manually and set up automation, and then turn the feature flag on already knowing that your feature works and you didn't break anything that was existing. The next thing you should do is use a canary release. So a canary release is just a fancy word for a percentage rollout. And this allows you to release your features to a small subset of users before you release it to your entire user base. And this is great because if something goes wrong and you do break something in production, would you want 100% of your users to encounter this issue or 1%? Um, the next thing is to start with an AA test, which just means that you give both sets of users in and out of the feature flag the same experience and make sure that the data coming in is the same for both. Um, and lastly, I recommend starting small. So don't start out with the most complex flow and decide to test that in prod, right? You want to start with something simple, a CTA change, a button change, a color change, something small that you can um, grow from. And so the outcome of testing in prod was just really amazing, right? So we were able to release faster because you're not tied to a specific release night. You can just push a button um, and, and the feature is released. Again, when you use feature flags, you're separating code deployment from feature release. So you really have the ability to release whenever you want. You also have an increased developer velocity. So your developers spend more time creating new features and less time fixing bugs. Again, because those bugs are caught much earlier in the development life cycle, um, they're, caught, they're caught much, much faster. Um, you also have an increased confidence in releases because again, you know your features are working in the environment that your features will live in, not a dummy environment. And obviously, like this makes the team really happy. It increases your engineering culture, um, and, it, and you just have an increased team happiness. So in case I have not convinced you that this is a good idea, I just want everyone to take a second and think about the last feature that your team deployed. All right, everyone's thinking about it. Think of the last feature your team deployed. Is it working right now in production? How do you know? Your users haven't reported anything to you. Your alarms haven't gone off. You haven't been paged. You don't, so you assume that it's working, right? But you don't know. Testing in production is the only way to know that your features are working right now in production. And oftentimes, shifting your company's testing culture is the hardest part of this process. So getting over that fear that we talked about before. So two things that I recommend is use examples from your past. So think about like, is your staging environment unreliable? I can tell you for a fact, yes, it is. Think about like, oh, hey, remember that time where we released this thing to production and you know it broke? And um, when we tested it in staging, it was perfect. And then when we released it, you know, shit hit the fan. Um, so think about those examples. And then start using feature flags. If you go to split.io, you can set up a free developer account. We have a ton of SDKs you can use um, to, to start with experimenting with, with feature flags. And in case you haven't been paying attention at all for the past 23 minutes, I want you to take away two things. The first is that nobody cares if your features are working in staging. We care if it works in production. And the only way to know if it's working in prod is to test it in prod. So this is my contact info. I'm on Twitter. You can email me. I'm happy to answer questions now. Um, but thank you guys so much for, for listening. And I'm excited to hear what you guys think. Well, thank you so much, Talia. That was great. And based on the chat, I think a lot of people felt like that was a really necessary therapy session for them <laughs> and that you totally understood and hit on uh, the pain points that uh, a lot of um, the attendees feel. So um, thank you for an awesome presentation. I'm going to jump in. There's a couple questions in the Slido Q&A section um, yeah. that I will share. Um, and if anybody has any other questions, feel free to drop them there. So uh, one of the questions is, how do you target users with feature flag? 
So you just list them. You list their user IDs. You can do it by ID. You can do it by email. Um, but you can just list them as um, list like their email addresses inside of, of Split in the UI. Great. And I I'm, I'm should make a note that I am not a technical person. I'm a lawyer. So if I blunder any of these uh, words or the, something doesn't make sense, uh, please have some patience with me and if and people are welcome to pipe up in the chat if I've totally miss, messed something up. So, okay, the next question is, does it have to be testing in production versus staging or could they be combined? As you said, there's a culture behind staging, QA environment, difficult to change. Yeah, so like I said in the beginning, testing in prod doesn't mean you only test in prod. So, you know, you do have those flows that you absolutely cannot test in production because of like GDPR and SOX and you know all, all these other like compliance issues. So you can absolutely use staging for those flows because if it's not possible, it's not possible. Um, but but um, I would recommend that those business critical flows that you know you absolutely depend on for your company to be successful, like those you should definitely try to test in production. Awesome, okay. This, I think this is a great uh, question. Was it a hard sell to your company that is testing in production? Um, yes, it's it's always going to be um, it's always going to be difficult to sell people on on this topic. But the thing is, like when you use experiences from the past and you and things like keep happening to you that could have been solved by testing in production, like it just it adds more fuel to your fire, you know. Um, we we would have these production incidents come up that like we would have just tested in staging um, and then they would break in production and you know things like that kept happening and and it was kind of like a group effort and we all wanted to be part of this like new change this like testing revolution in our company um and we did it and it worked um and you know at the end of the day there's always going to be people who say Testing and production will never work, and you know you have to use staging environments. But you know what? I don't care about those people. Like they can go sit in the corner and do things the way they've been doing them for the past thirty years. But um, I want to innovate. I want to move forward. I want to. Um, I want to test in production. I don't want to use the staging environment. So you can go sit in the corner with your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about a lot of things. Yeah, uh, and, and this I think is a semi related question. Julian says you're great at explaining complex tester concerns to developer teams. Can you talk more about how you influence technical teams as a tester? Yeah, um, this is kind of the same approach. It's just using examples from the past. Um, a lot of times when, when we have like big releases, like our whole team is involved, like technical people and non-technical people and just getting them on board to understand um, the issues that, that we're seeing. Um, I think, I don't think it matters if you're technical or not, as long as you understand like the problem we're trying to solve. Awesome, okay, I'm gonna ask one more question then I have to hop off for my next session. Um, but people can feel free to stay and ask questions here um, after the session's over. So the last one is, what were some of the tools that you used to test in prod? Yeah, so um, I, I went over these in, in, in a slide before, but um, so for, for feature flagging split, um, for an automation framework, I, my absolute favorite is robot. I can't speak highly enough of, of about robot. Um, and then for um, an alerting tool, there's PagerDuty and Slack. And for job schedulers, um, there's uh, you know Jenkins and Circle CI and and uh, Travis and Maven. Great. Well, thank you so much, Talia. I really appreciate it, and it looks like the attendees really love that. So thank you so much, um, and I hope to see everybody at future sessions. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. I'm happy to answer them on Twitter, whatever you guys would like.
Oh, there's more questions on Slido. Okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going to Slido. Okay, so if you want to test functionality that requires code changes that are not compatible with the current version, oh, that's so funny because I actually skipped a slide in my presentation that went over database migrations that um, that I think answers this. But basically, whenever you have changes that, that affect um, two different versions of code, you want to make sure that you wrap your feature flag around the elements of your code base, not around the elements of your database, so that when you do have changes, you're able to, um, to revert without making any additional um, migrations or anything like that. Um, would you create multiple users in prod? Yes. Testing different configurations or different users have different permissions? Yes. So for every different, um, all of the different configuration types, user types, you can have, you should have multiple users in production. You just have to make sure that you manage them efficiently and you make sure that, um, you know, you have all of the types of users that you need um, and just manage them efficiently. Uh, yes, that's the correct site for split. It's just split.io. Um, I also have a ton of tutorials on there. If you go on um, the split.io engineering blog, I have tutorials on how to set up feature flags. Um, cool. Well, I think that's all the questions. Um, feel free to find me on Twitter. Um, send me an email if you guys have anything else. But um, this was great. And thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.